tonight is sort of the last lecture where I will be reviewing the last subjects that I want to cover for this class. Uh, and I made the decision to make sure to see groups. Uh, it's actually been very encouraging because today I received some uh, drafts which were much be better than before. So I think we are getting there. And so that's the good news. So it's, it's coming together. This evening we'll have 15 minutes each and then we'll have again 15 minutes next uh, Wednesday, but there's no reason why we could not meet in between. So do not hesitate to ask me for a meeting if, if needed. Last week, we finished with the product and the new product development. Pricing is actually the only P that doesn't cost money. Every P is an expense. Pricing is a decision that you have to make and it's not an expense. The idea is that you have a price in order to make sure that you have a sale, the minimum sale. You have a price because you're trying to make more profit. You have a price because you try to get market share. And you have a price which is determining people's perception of your quality. If you have a low price compared to your competitors, people may think that you're not as good as your competitors. If you have a high price, they will perceive that you're maybe better than your competitors, but then they may not buy you because you'll, you'll be perceived as the most expensive. So the price is, is a very strategic decision, and it's important to understand the components in, within this. So the first thing is, how do you define your prices? It's a combination of the fixed cost and the variable cost. So the fixed cost, they don't change the more product that you make. So you, your building um, rent doesn't change. That you make one or that you make a thousand, the building rent st stays the same. Obviously, if you are making many more, suddenly you have to change the building and then the overhead will go up. But for, for a certain quantity, the, the, from one to 100, it doesn't change. But maybe to make more than 100, suddenly you have to have a, a more expensive rent. The executive salaries is the same thing. That doesn't change. So you may want to try to compress as much the fixed cost by having more products being delivered and therefore to reduce the cost of each product being made uh, uh, from the fixed cost as much as possible. So the variable cost, they change the more services, the more products that you make. And so this total cost is very important. And it, it's important to see that you're constantly trying to produce more in order to reduce the unit cost uh, associated with the fixed cost. But also when you produce more, you become more gifted, more experienced. And that's called the experience curve because you become better at making the same thing as the repetition is teaching you to uh, be faster at making it and go to, to the essential and um, just be more ef efficient in your production. So the experience curve is increase efficiency with more experience. Price elasticity is either inelastic when the domain doesn't change much by a small change in price. So you reduce the, the price, people don't buy more. You increase the price, people don't buy more, therefore the demand is inelastic. But then if the people change because you increase a little bit or you decrease in a little bit, this is called an elastic demand. So you want to see how much elasticity there is in the price. So that's important, for example, when you're looking at the Porter 5 forces, because the Porter 5 forces will determine if people uh, are sensitive to the prices and they will be looking for substitutes. So substitute products may be the result of people's sensitivity to the prices, for example. Now, let's look at a few um, methods for pricing that you may want to have. So the most basic one is called the cost-based pricing, which is how much does it cost plus the percentage. So everything is plus 5%. Like, let's say you're um, a sales agent, and so everything that you sell gets 10% and the company you work for as an agent own you 10%. But then your manufacturer is the same thing, is you just add a percentage. This is great because it's simple, but it's not so great because it's a rule that it's just based on a percentage. So it's, it's more of a decision made by, a, for example, an accountant, someone who's not looking at the competitors, someone who's not looking at the perceived value of the product, someone that is not looking at the, the amount of innovation that the product brings, and therefore they just 
adding a percentage in order to be the percentage that they estimate is the minimum that needs to be added in order to make some money and have this business survive. The break even based, this time is not a accountant perspective, it's a finance perspective. Like that's what you see the most of the times uh, when you're looking at a program called Shark Tank. In Shark Tank, the break even is very much like how many do we need to sell to have a return on investment of X. So for example, a shark uh, will want to invest in a business if they see that within a certain time, they will get their money back. So they give $100,000 for 10%. They see how much product needs to be sold in order for them to get back their $100,000. So obviously, is the, the higher the cost of the product, the higher the, um, the fixed cost, the more product you have to sell. That's what you're going to try to do is sell the most product as possible in order to increase the profit and then increase the return on investment. So break even is calculated by a simple Excel spreadsheet where you try to see what's the right number of product that you need to sell. So the right number of product that you need to sell is evaluated by making a, a forecast of how many product you think you will be able to sell within the time period. And so this forecast is the maximum number of products. You estimate your costs, you estimate your margin, and then you estimate how much profit you will be making and giving back to the investor. So um, th this will not be the focus so much uh, of this class because we haven't spent a lot of time on this break even, but the break even is something that is very important in the entrepreneurship class. So the next class, the reality is I would like if I was only teaching this class, I would probably make sure that I spend more time on the break even. But because I'm also teaching the next class, I'm sort of um, uh, balancing things. And, uh, you know, there's so much to do that I'm spreading it. And there will be a spillover in the next class. Break even is extremely important for entrepreneurs, I believe. And that's why you see it as the main type of pricing methods used by uh, investors and, and the Shark Tank. A program, for example. So the value based is the, so I said cost based is more of an accountant mentality, break even is more of a finance uh, person mentality, and the value based is very much of a marketing uh, marketer mentality. Why is this? Because it's the one that worries about the, what is the perceived value that the consumer are thinking that they're getting from the product. So obviously it's the one that is the most sort of uh, um, consumer, customer driven, because is what we they are getting from the product is what they should be paying for. Unfortunately, you know, there they are competitors and there's other issues uh, such as the, the, the element of making profit, which is within the break even and making sure that you make some money, which is within cost based. So by saying this, I'm trying to tell you that none of these are perfect. Oftentimes, it's very important to understand those four elements of pricing in order to understand how you should be pricing with the last one being how much is what's the price of our competitors and sometimes it is very difficult because you work in an industry where there are a lot of uh, third world countries or countries which have a much more affordable um, uh, an hourly rate and raw materials and less um, regulations that you can produce at a much lower price. And so the competitor-based price becomes an issue. And that's an issue because suddenly you cannot compete against this product uh, being imported. So then you hope the government will start protecting you for making the, domestic, the product domestically, but it's not always the case. And you may have a, a total industry that disappears. So an example of this is the toys, for example, um, which have pretty much disappeared in the 90s in the United States of America not 100% disappeared, but mostly disappeared for toys that would be made overseas compared to the one made in America. Yes, Luis, you have a question. How would you apply value-based pricing to um, the service industry, such as consulting, where the product is, so to speak, um, intangible? Uh, the, the consumer has no way of... Um, seeing or touching the quality of that product how do you so, apply that yeah so the um, 
even if you have a service, you have attributes. You have uh, components of quality. Um, so I'll give you an example. If you fly Spirit Airline versus if you fly the British Airways or Delta Airline, you see a big difference when it comes to the, um, the perceived value. Um, Spirit Airline, the counter opens three minutes before the, the flight is supposed to take off. So then everybody is super stressed what is going on. Then right away, it almost looks like this. That's the first time that they're taking care of customers. So you wonder what is going on. The plane is late. So if you have a, a connection, you most likely miss your connection. And so you, Spirit Airline is the, the type of service that you only use once. Just it, it takes one time to know how bad it is not to do it again. So the services is, are, are very much that way as well. There's attributes. So there's some people that just want to pay the cheapest every time because they have value. Main value is trying to buy the cheapest thing. And some people, they have some um, expectation of the return on their money, the experience they may have had with other uh, similar services before. So when you do consulting, the issue is who are you dealing it with? If you're dealing with Big clients, uh, you're going to have to offer a lot of services. The big clients are used to pay a lot of money, but they, they used to be pampered. Can you afford to pamper? Uh, maybe you can't because you are like an independent consultant, contractor, where the, the issues that you're really offering. So in that situation, you want probably to specialize, not try to offer everything, but find a, something that you can be really an expert and then surround yourself of other experts in different areas. So that way you can have a referral between all of these people where people will get the most attention from um, an agency, which is just one person that doesn't do everything, but what they do is they do very well. And then they have this referral of all the other people that can be used for the different elements that they will be bringing to the table. So the value is in the eye of the customer. So you need to see who is it that you're serving and what is it the value that they want. Um, for example, I do consulting uh, um, uh, within the College of Business and the most common request is help with Instagram and TikTok. The, what's very nice is the students oftentimes are very knowledgeable of helping a business with Instagram and TikTok, but that was not the case. Um, I would say seven years ago, the students didn't already know what to, what to do with this. The client didn't know, they didn't know what to expect. The students didn't know how to do it. Now they know. But the issue is the students don't have a, a very good understanding of strategies. So oftentimes it's very much trying to solve immediate problems and just create content, but without the understanding of the positioning, because working on positioning, working on branding, on corporate image, that's a strategic decision. And versus the TikTok, it's just trying to post as, as consistently as possible. But what is the theme and all of that? So the value base is first understanding who's your customers and what are they expecting from you. And once you see what they're expecting, then you start selecting the customer that you think you can fulfill the, uh, the value. Which, what's very important is there's a difference between value and satisfaction. Value is measured before the consumption. So at the moment of purchase, versus satisfaction is measured after the consumption. So value is what I, I'm analyzing when I have the credit card in my hand and I'm looking at the far between the choices. Satisfaction is once I have no more credit card, I actually have the product or the service. And at that time, I see if it meets my expectations. So that's why you have to see who's the target, what are the expectation in order to, to generate the satisfaction, but at the same time, understand the element that they are looking for, the attributes that they're looking for. Are they looking for someone that's going to do something very quick? Are they looking for someone that they can go back and get more help afterwards? Are they looking for someone who is convenient? You know, so what are the elements that you're trying to make yourself uh, have a just noticeable difference to make yourself better? So value, gen D, just noticeable difference, satisfaction, and uh, positioning, all of this is connected. Does that answer your question? 
It definitely does. Thank you very much. Yeah. So yes. So so you know. So where does it start? Well, it starts by STP. Who are the customers? What do they want? What are the attributes? And then my positioning. But like I said the other time, the best way is PSTP. What can I offer? What am I good at? What is the image that I want to build right now and grow? P, then STP. The, the second P is a repositioning. It's an adjustment, you know. And that's, if you understand this, then for entrepreneurship, it's tremendous to understand that because it's PSTP. That's the best method, I think, to be an entrepreneur because you don't want to be dreaming and giving people to people to people what are your dreams and then finding there's nobody really has the same dream but you want to be dreaming then looking at the market and see who is most likely to like your dream and then adjust your dream and then give it to them and then they recognize it and then they follow you and so yeah so this all of this is very important because it's very strategic this is not tactical and for some people we are talking about services being tangible what i just said right now may sound too abstract and they are wondering what I'm talking about, even if it's English or something. It's possible. I can see that. But the reality is you have to think about this. And the, the people that are successful, either they thought of it or they just had this thinking naturally that they didn't realize that they were thinking about positioning and all of this. But they were doing it because they just had this good common sense. But then once you know what you're doing and the word that they are, it makes you better because then you can work through the steps and make sure that you didn't miss them and um, and that you give them equal weight. And then you do it one time, two times, three times, and then you become more experienced. And then you develop your own recipe of how you manipulate all of this. But you know that they exist. Thank you for your question. So I just dis discussed the methods. Now I'm going to discuss the strategies. So these are strategies at the pricing level and the, the two biggest one are scheming and penetration. Scheming means that you're going to try to have the highest price as possible because you have a very innovative product because you think your competitors have inferior value. You have the highest value and therefore you can do scheming. Um, you want to position yourself as the, as the best quality. Penetration is the opposite. You're going to try to have the lowest price as possible. Maybe not the lowest price, but one of the within the low prices. And the difference here is you would want to get market share. So scheming is the focus is let's make the biggest margin. And it doesn't matter if we make a large number of sales. We're just trying to set the precedent. The problem by doing this is then you will have competitors coming with lower prices because you started with high prices right away. You'll be not right away, but pretty soon your competitors will come and be just cheaper. So people will start, start saying, oh, why don't I buy a cheaper version of the original version? And that's the risk is you sort of um, making the door open for competitors by having a high price. However, you will be the one that will make the most profit. Therefore, you'll be the one that will advertise more, have more resources to innovate the product, to um, improve with the distribution and so forth. The problem, again, if you start with penetration pricing is you will have a lower margin. So yes, that will make it harder for someone and compete because they're going to be less motivated to compete in a market where there's low margin because you started with low margin. But at the same time, um, because you'll have low margin, you better have a lot of sales in order to make uh, overall profit in order to reinvest it and also control of your, of your market by investing in your market to keep this market share. So, which one is the best? The, I cannot answer which one is the best between scheming and penetration. They are very different. Uh, it depends of the company, it depends on the, the, the market, the target. It depends if this is a, um, a technology. If you are in a technology industry, maybe you could have scheming because that may, will make more sense because innovation really will separate yourself. But if you are um, starting, um, a bakery, a restaurant, and maybe you, you want to do penetration pricing based on the market where you are right now. Then there's two other uh, pricing strategies. There's product line pricing, which is selling product based on the options. So you sell um, a guitar, and then there are different 
a chord on the guitar. There's the nylon, uh, uh, cheapest version, and then you have different type of material, a different type of wood, and the different type of wood and uh, will make a different price for the guitar. They all look the same, but suddenly there's different accessories option on the product that make it um, more expensive. Uh, different finishes, um, uh, uh, different elements, different uh, uh, connections that, that, you know, on the guitar that will allow you with these different options to have different prices. So that's part of the product line and it's optional. Captive is when you sell a product where you would be making money on not the main product, but on the 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 the, the usable product that you will be selling with it. So typical situation with this is that you're selling a printer and you're selling the printer for hundred dollars, but then you're selling the cartridge for fifty dollars. So people buy the printer with already already a, a cartridge, but that cartridge is not a full cartridge, the cartridge that's just going to allow for some printing so that that way people can use it. But then you quickly have to buy the cartridge. So yeah, building your customer base. Yes, you, you're building your customer base because sometimes those cartridges are, pro, are patented and proprietary to the machine that you're buying. So a Hewlett Packard will be different than a Ericsson, than a, some other... Um, Nokia from other brands. And so that would be the, the captive element. What's interesting about the captive is you already consciously knowing that you may be making 5% on the printer when people buy the printer, but then you'd be making 200%, 300% money on the cartridge. So the cartridge is you'll wait for the cartridge, but cartridge that happens soon. And that's where they start making, you start making a huge percentage of profit on those captive. Um, mm. So the, the byproduct and is when you make um, a product and then as in the process of making this product, they are byproducts. So you're making wood furniture and then you get sawdust and then you sell the sodas to the zoo. So you're not in the business of selling sodas to the zoo, but these sodas that you just made is, is, is good for the zoo, right? So I'm in the, the spirit industry. And um, when you make wine, at the end, you end up with a leftover of what you couldn't make wine from. So the skin, some pulp, uh, the seeds, and there's companies that will actually buy these. It's called pomas. And then they will actually re-ferment uh, the pomas. And uh, they will be distilling the re-fermented liquid in order to create, uh, for example, a grappa. A grappa is like a whiskey or like a vodka made from the pomas. And normally it's supposed to be made in Italy. But for example, in America, uh, there's no protection for grappa. It's one of the only country uh, that does not protect, uh, that Italy doesn't have a protection for. So you can make grappa in America, but that's on one of the few countries, but that's a sideline. The concept is that when you're making wine, you usually have to pay to get rid of the leftover. Uh, but in Italy, they were smart. They actually use that leftover and they make a spirit. And so that's a byproduct that if you're in Italy, you can actually sell for the people making the grappa. Bundling is when you have a, a pricing strategy where people can buy um, a combination of products. Uh, it's like they're buying toothpaste and toothbrushes together. And so instead of being the toothpaste $2 and the toothbrush $3, $5, you can be buying both for $4. So the combination of the, the product that you are usually are complementary makes it cheaper. So you're buying a season tickets uh, for um, a symphony, each ticket will cost you less than if you were selling each uh, ticket because the season tickets will have 12 tickets. And if you divide the 12 by the cost, you will be saving 30% of the price if you just bought 12 times one ticket. 
So bundling is a pricing strategy that allows you to sell more products, to sell excess inventory, to introduce new products because you could be introducing a new product in this bundle and people will try it and say, oh, that's pretty good and then buy this product. Um, and you could, you could uh, make more profit in the sense that you're increasing your sales of product. So just another strategy to think of. Do you have any question about this uh, pricing strategies? Um, is uh, optional is the one that was uh, the, the spirits, right? So it's captive with his printer example. Yes. But... So optional, you know, it's like if you buy a car and you get electric windows as an option, leather seats as an option, air conditioning as an option, sunroof as an option. So optional is that actually, if you look at German cars, they're oftentimes like this. They tell you, oh, BMW, it's a 39,999. And then the new uh, three series sport. So then you go to the dealership and you ask them if they have one and they tell you they only have one and it's orange. And every, if you want a silver, they have many, but it's the one with the option and they are not 39,999, they are 60,000 because they have the leather seats, they have ABS, they have all kinds of things. So on the sta standard version, they don't make a lot of money. They make money on the, the one with the big radio because the radio, they're gonna charge $1,500, $2,000 when in fact it costs them only $300. So the beauty with the optional is that the percentage you make on the option is much more than the percentage that you make on the main product. So it's like you were uh, buying a, a plane ticket and the luggage are not included and the, 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 the lunch or dinner is not included. On the plane, they make 25%, but on the lunch, even though they sell it to you for $30, they make 300% on that. So the optional is, is you buy a, a guitar and then you, you buy the, the bag that goes with the guitar. So the guitar, they sell it $400. Maybe they make $25 on this, so very little. But the bag, they sell it to you for $65. And on of the $65, maybe they make $30. So in fact, they end up making more money with the, the accessories, the option, than they actually do with the main product. Or you go to McDonald's and they say, do you want a large fries? The large fries is the option. And in fact, they make more profit on the large fries that they would by then selling the, 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 the combination or, uh, so options is a way of increasing profit margin because the profit margin on the option is much higher than the profit margin on the main product that you're buying. Does that answer your question, Brian? Kind of, except I would have thought that the uh, combination was, uh, and the guitar was an example of bundling guitar bag and uh oh, well it can be it can be also so you can have bundling it's true so the the issue is the um because the, the, the guitar i get because you have a, a set thing leather versus if you're going to have a seat anyway so in my mind your options example for the car was the best because yes. the car is going to have a seat it can be leather or it could be cloth the car is going to have yes. windows. The electric they could be but with a burger, you don't necessarily have to have fries. So that's yes. why it's bundling. Okay. So, so for example, let's, let's imagine that you have like um, 100 guitars in your store and 200 bags. Right. In that situation, maybe you want to do bundling as a pricing strategy because you have so many bags, you want to you get really rid of the bags. You have too many bags. Right. But now let's say you have 100 guitars and you have 50 bags. Now mm -hmm. you're going to do op optional. Because okay, you, so you're speaking more to the strategy of it versus the actual yeah. component. Yes, it has to be. It has to be the. So you look at your inventory and then you make a strategy on it from mm -hmm. a pricing perspective. Okay. Excuse me. Question. Yes. Yeah, I, I see you very familiar with guitars. I'm a guitar player, but but Epiphone sells his guitar, and when I bought it, it was like four hundred dollars, and then. A few years later, it was a thousand. Same guitar. Yeah. It's made like the J200 uh, Gibson, but it's an Epiphone, but it's stereo. Real cool guitar. 
and I, I found one out of the, out of the stack that was really something better than the other ones. But I just noticed a couple of years later, it went from four hundred dollars to eight, and then now a thousand. I'm just wondering why did they do that? So, so in this situation, sounds like demand. That's the same thing with mixers. The X32 was seventeen. Then it went up when people started buying it, and it got scarce. It went to twenty nine. Yeah, so so things go up and things go down based on demand. Exactly, so that's the number one. But it's also based on on your uh, inventory. Maybe you have lower inventory, and therefore suddenly you just have the price go up. Because right, this one has something different. This one is stereo. It has to pick up under the bridge. I mean, under the neck that gets the for the fingers. And the Gibson doesn't have that, but it has these are like say option. It comes with it like already with the stereo pickup, two plugs, and that kind of thing. Those options with it. So comes standard. Normally, the the more you spend, the more option you're going to find on the product, right? If you go to a five star hotel, there's things that come with the five star room that would be option for another type of hotel. So the more you spend, the more the options are included. Because it's expected. It's again, it's um, it's it's a, it's what you perceive as the value. You go to a, a five star hotel. There's got to be a jacuzzi inside, um, the the bathroom. There needs to be bubble in that bath, right? There needs to be a bath, and there needs to be a bath with bubble. Um, then, you go to this hotel, but you want it to be, I, I don't know, Wi-Fi protected. You know, that's like the ultimate things in hotels is that there's no wife no wi-fi um toxicity so now that's what rich people ask as an option so the the room where the wi-fi doesn't go through there's no antenna wi-fi from outside or whatever it's protected you will pay more because most uh, uh, five-star hotels don't have all the rooms that way they just have a few rooms that way so it's an option so it'd be more expensive I don't know if you heard Randy my answer. Yes, so, I did. Thank you. So now we're going to look at distribution. Distribution mm -hmm. is the concept that you have intermediaries, and these intermediaries serve the service of making the product available to the target. And so that seems very little, but it's a big deal because a distribution is a totally different product than the than the production. And um, you, uh, being inside the uh, the music industry, you you know better than um, most of my students. Them dealing with how difficult it is to do distribution. In fact, you know, we're working with Lodi right now and that just at the level of Lodi, we can see that it's one thing to be, you know, writing the music and singing and all this, but it's another one to get the distribution and get it to the people. So distribution in itself is a business in itself that is very separate and very different. And it's very expensive to get the distribution, which means to get the product to the final users, not cheap. And so it's much better be left to someone whose specific job is to do distribution. It's true in the music industry. I mean, I know there's um, people um, self-distributing and there's some people like extremely uh, successful with this using the modern technology and, and the direct to consumers technology. But for the most part, that's still difficult and, and, and not always um, the easiest thing in every pretty much in industry. So. Even in uh, one of the industry that work, again, in the spirit industry, they, they are people that make spirits and sell it direct to customers. It's difficult with the spirits because you need to have licenses in order to sell it to, to um, uh, consumers. So the issue with this is oftentimes uh, the government makes it very difficult in that specific industry, which is the same with the tobacco or the firearms. You need licenses. So by default, you have to find someone who has the license in some industries and therefore um, you cannot do it. Sometimes they make the law that it cannot be the same person that manufacture, uh, wholesale and retail even. It has to be three different licenses. Anyway, so what our distributor job is, is to collect information on the market. So you're doing research for your business, but your distributor will also do some research. We'll talk to the customers, we'll talk to the salespeople, and we'll collect information on what they think should be the next product or maybe the improvements that you could be making on the product. They will also promote the product by giving people information, by giving discounts, 
by giving incentives for them to buy it, by creating events and promoting the product. There will be a point of contact, all of these um, customers, you know, so you'll have thousands, millions of customers, they will be contacting your point of distribution in order to get information. So that saves you the work of having someone that is managing these thousands, these hundreds of thousands. So it's a point of contact. They will be matching the needs of the distribution network. Um, so if you're thinking about a farmer, for example, uh, who sells chicken, and that's all you do. Uh, it's very rare that people do their shopping by buying uh, milk from the milkman and chicken from the farm chicken and carrots from another farm. They like to buy all of these from one single place, from a supermarket. So the distribution network is the one that takes care of all of these logistics for all of these products that are usually not always but produced by one producer that produces, let's say, one product. It all gets matched and uh, organized within hubs where it's easier for the consumers to get access to these. They will negotiate as well. So the idea of the distributors is they negotiate between the different intermediaries in the network of distribution. They will be storing and uh, looking at inventory. They will be buying the product before the consumer buys it. So when you are a manufacturer, you start making uh, money, not from not usually directly from the customers buying the product, even though you could sell directly, but most of the time you'll have intermediaries. So the intermediaries will be your customers. So that's why when you are a manufacturer, you oftentimes in B2B, business to business by selling to the distribution network and a B2C because you're also selling to the customers. When you make a product is for the customers, but you also need to get the interest of the distribution to carry the product. And that's part of the issue related to the risk. They will take risk to take your product. So again, what are the format? There's the producer that sells to the customer. That's the direct channel of distribution. Then you have the producer that sells to one intermediary, let's say a retail store that sells to the customers. And then you have another one, which is the one that you sell to a wholesaler that sells to a retailer, and then that sells to um, your customers. You can also have intermediaries in between all of these, like the people that take care of the um, accounting, logistics, the truck driver, the warehouses, the intermediaries, the custom brokers, the brokers, all of these different people are what's called the J here, the jobbers, people that help in between the different level of distribution, but they're part of it. So this, this is sort of complicated, but the, the idea is it's not complicated. It's like when you do distribution, it's the same thing as you are Amazon and you wonder about your customers. You are Costco and you wonder about your customers. You are Albertsons and you wonder who are your customers. If you go to even um, different Albertsons, you will see that not all Albertsons are the same. In fact, they use the zip code in order to tra track people and see what kind of modification do they need to do in each one of the different stores. So for example, I sell in a store, which is the biggest one um, in America, it's called Total Wine and Spirits. And Total Wine and Spirits, not my, my cognac are not in all the Total Wine and Spirits. What they have is they have a profile for my cognac. So it's, it's a sort of a, a luxury high-end cognac which they cannot sell to every total wine. They only sell it to a specific group of customers, which they know uh, belongs to some total wine. So they sell in probably 20% of the total wine, my product, not all of them based on the type of customers that they know go to this total wine. So for example, if it's a total wine, which is close to an uh, Asian neighborhood, uh, they will be selling my cognac because the Asian look for, um, either the cheapest cognac or the most expensive. They don't sort of go in the, in the middle. It depends who they drink it with. If they drink it by themselves, they look for the cheapest cognac. If they drink it in group, they look for the most expensive cognac or the cognac from the biggest brand. The more the brand is famous, the more they will consume it. Oftentimes they also buy this product to sell it to people as a gift. So all of this information on the customers is very relevant and therefore it generates who you're selling it to. So you look at the different uh, customers and then you, you have three distribution strategies. Intensive distribution, you sell it everywhere. Selective distribution, you define who, which area uh, belongs to your market and you sell it there. And exclusive distribution is not only you don't sell it everywhere, just some 
specific places, but you have a agreement with the distribution in how many should they sell in order to keep the exclusivity. You define the area, you define the volume that they should be the selling, the ob objectives, and if they meet the objectives, then they keep the ex exclusivity. Another strategy, so that was three strategy, intensive, selective, and exclusive. The fourth big strategy in distribution is called push and pull strategies. So that's something that I teach my undergraduates, but I don't make it a big deal, but it's a bigger deal for a postgraduate student, master students. So push strategy is when you are providing incentive through your distribution network, through the intermediaries, starting from the wall seller to the retailer to the customers. So if you say to the wall seller, if you buy one, I'll give you one for free. In that situation, the wall seller sh should think that it's worth buying more now. So instead of buying one pallet, they're going to buy two pallets. And then they will also give a, pr a special price to the retailer, which is also going to give a special price to the customers. So the customers, when they go to the store or when they look online on Amazon, they see there is a special discount or they go on eBay or wherever they go, they see a special discount and they will be buying the product. That discount, most of the time, was initiated by the producer giving a discount. Sometimes you give a discount to the wall seller and then they sell at the same price to the retailer who sells it to the customer and the wall seller just makes more money at that moment. But normally uh, they try to take advantage of this to give further the incentives. The beauty of the push strategy is that it's the least expensive and the most effective because if you, so let me def define what's the pull strategy so you understand. The pull strategy is you don't try to convince the distribution network from the bottom, wall seller, retailer, customers, but you go straight to the customers. So the best example of this is the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl is you advertise in the Super Bowl, everybody sees it, and then everybody wants it because they've seen it in the Super Bowl. So then they look for the product because they saw this cool product, this cool ad during the Super Bowl, and then they go to the retailer looking for the product, they find it in the retailer, and then they buy the product. What happens then is the retailer is very motivated because they have all of these customers that have seen the ads, the commercial, and therefore they will call quickly the wall seller, say, I want more product, and suddenly you get a lot of phone call and a lot of love from the wall sellers because they want your product because they know the customers are looking for them. You know, it's the difference between uh, Coca-Cola versus um, RC Cola. RC Cola, you go, negotiate with the distributors, you say, you know, please take my product. And then they say, what's the price? Did you reduce the price? Yes, I reduced the price. Oh, since you reduced the price, I'll take some product. But it's a different ball game with Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, they beg Coca-Cola to give them more product. More, because if they buy more product, they get a discount. But Coca-Cola does um, uh, wants to put pressure on the, the retailer and the wall seller in that situation, they own the wall seller most of the time, uh, Coca-Cola, but it's not always the case. They will put pressure on the retailer for the retailer to sell it a certain price and not have discount. And they will sell it as high as possible because Coca-Cola wants to keep the profit for themselves. So the push and pull, if you combine both, that's the best case scenario because you try to maximize the fact that customers are looking for the product. And at the same time, you're giving incentive to the distribution network and so it goes both ways. They both motivated. If you're a small business, the most likely uh, scenario that you will be using is the push strategy. Even though you could be using social media and social media is this sort of this new invention. It's still new, it's pretty much 10, 12 years that uh, small businesses have been able to use social media, which used to be very inexpensive. It's not so much the case, but used to be very inexpensive to talk directly to the customers. So the customers care about your about you through Instagram or Facebook, and then they want to buy the product and they call, look for retailers, they will carry the product. And then you talk to the retailers and you say, look, all the Facebook things, all the followers that we have, you got to have our, our product. So the retailer will look at how many followers you have and then they'll say, I want your product. We see this in the music industry is that let's try to have as many followers as possible because that's going to help for concerts and for some or, or so many different things. Uh, yes, Brian. Uh, the least expensive and most effective, was that the push or the pull? So the, the push is the most effective. And, and least expensive. And least expensive, yes. So I'll give you an example. Um, right. Imagine you 
imagine you, you, you sell wine. So there's a bottle of wine here. Mm -hmm. And you put a, a necktie and it says 50% off. It doesn't cost you anything besides making the necktie. If people don't buy the product, which you don't sell, if people buy the product, you don't make much money, but at least they're buying the product. So that's, that's a push. Because when you look at the, the wall seller, is you're going to say, here's a necktie, it's going to be cheaper. So there's two ways. Either the customer buy the product and then you give them the, restore, the, the reduction afterwards. Or you sell the product for cheaper as you have with the necktie. The best way is you give nobody discounts. People are buying nothing. Imagine the case scenario, you make a thousand neckties and you don't sell any bottle. How much does it cost you? Just the neckties. Now the pool will be saying, okay, let's put an ad in the LA Times, in the magazine, on the radio. So a magazine ad, it's going to be, uh, let's say, $10,000. So now you've spent $10,000. You may be selling nothing, but they did take your wire. The, the wire is gone. The check is gone. The money is gone. You lost $10,000. So that's why the pool is more risky, because you don't have control. With the push, you have more control. Is you give a discount as long as they buy. As long as you buy, it will be 50% off. Okay. So that's why it's very important to understand that. That's critical uh, for entrepreneurs. That's like a break, a deal breaker is because you're an entrepreneur, you got some money. The first reaction is let's do a lot of pull, advertise, you know, all this, these different things. And so therefore you spend a lot of money. You, 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 you kill your budget. You have nothing left in your budget anymore. But did it generate sales? You don't know. Maybe. Versus the push is people come and they say, oh, I want your consulting services. I want you to, to sing or to do a concert. Okay, if, if I, you let me do it right now, I'll do it for 50% off. I mean, you're doing it. You're making some money. So this off is money that you lost, but at least you got some, some money in. So you made some money, you lost some money. Versus the pool is you just spend money in hope that it turns into a sale. So that doesn't mean I don't like pool. It just means that you have, don't have as much control. And therefore, if you're a small business, you're an entrepreneur, you're starting a business, and you have saved money for the past five years, start with the push, what you have control over. But obviously, eventually, you want to get as quickly as possible to, the, to do both. Now, what about this world of domination? So that's very important. The domination of the bargaining power of who is buying. So if you're a manufacturer, you have the benefit of making quality product. You know what you're making and you know it's better. And therefore you keep improving the quality of what you're making. You have your reputation, you have a brand. So imagine you are like, um, you're making tires. And so you know these tires are gonna be good for 20,000 miles. And that's why you give a warranty for 20,000 miles. Versus you're making fantastic tires and you know that they're worth 50,000 miles. So it's a 50,000, it's a 80,000 miles warranty. Great. Then you have your reputation. People, when they buy it, it's more expensive, but it lasts longer. And then when you manufacture, you sell, we can take Michelin versus, um, 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 you know, a, 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 a not so famous brand like Cooper or something like this. And so then you know that um, if you are a tire seller and you sell the Michelin, you're going to have a lot of people that come to get the Michelin or the Goodyear and uh, Pirelli's and all this. But this, the smaller brand, you're selling them because it's a discount. But just doing discount tires doesn't get you as rich as selling the big brand names. So you contribute by being a manufacturer of a brand, you contribute to the benefit of the distribution channel. I mean, like I said, if you're a supermarket, you're much better off selling Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola and Sprite and Gatorade than selling the no-brand soda. The no-brand soda, people don't get too excited about this. Um, and, and therefore, you, as a distributor, you want the big brands. And therefore, as a manufacturer, you know that's your power. Those distributors want your big brand because they want to make profit, because it attracts people. Consumer loyalty means there is repeat purchase. So that's very important. But the distributor perspective is oftentimes their location, if it's online, whatever the name.com that people know, the fact that they buy a lot. You know, when they come to you, 
normally a customer won't buy one, will buy two, will buy three. But when you are a distributor, they will be buying hundreds, thousands, ten thousand, hundreds of thousands. So a distributor is very important because of their, their sales volume, therefore their purchase volume. So for example, me, I, I sell 30,000 bottles of cognac, but I sell those 30,000 bottles of cognac out of 10 people. So how many customers do I have that give me money? I have 10, but then it, that's the B2B. But then I have 30,000 bottles that go to the market. And so I have to have a good relationship with the, those 10 distributors because just 10 people cover all those different markets. Um, and then also they have their consumer, consumer their uh, image, you know, like, should I buy from, um, uh, you know, um, Foot Locker or should I buy from uh, Big, uh, um, uh, Big Five? my uh, tennis shoes, my running shoes. So there's a different image, Foot Locker versus Big Five. And they have consumer loyalty as well, people that like that distributor and would rather buy just from that distributor. So pros and cons, bargaining power, at the end of the day, it's kind of tough because most of the power goes to the, to the distributors. Right now, if you want to get rich, you're much better off becoming a distributor than you become, you know, um, you should become a brand. A brand is requires more stamina, requires um, more investments, long-term investments. Usually you're selling one thing, two things. Are you producing one thing, two things? So it's, it's tough to get it going versus the distribution. It's easier. And in fact, if you look at the top 50 richest people in the world, you will see that there's very few manufacturers. Um, in the top 10 wealthiest people in America, I think the only one that is there is uh, Elon Musk that is making something. Everybody else is a service, is a distributor, pretty much. So, and if you look the way it was 20 years ago, there was less distributors that were in the top 50. If you look 100 years ago, almost everybody was a manufacturer. So the power of the bargaining power of manufacturers has gone down for the past 100 years. And one of the reasons is a lot of distributors actually bought the brand that they were selling. And they started selling, distributing brands that they had shares or full ownership, which make them control the manufacturer. And therefore, they even make sometimes, uh, you, you know, like you can buy a Vons brand or a Safeway brand, which is the brand actually made by the manufacturer for the profit of the distributor, because sometimes the distributor comes and say, I will carry your product, but you need to make some under my name. It's called a private label. And so that makes things very tough. And that's why it's important to see this bargaining power of the retailer and the wealth seller. So the retailers involve all the activities of selling the goods directly to the customers. So it's B2C. Versus the wealth seller is for the most part is to sell to a, a business. So it's a B2B, but it's also B2C in large volumes. What type of wall seller do we have? We have the wall seller, which is the, the producer that also does the wall selling. But also what you have is wall sellers that are also retailers. So what do wall sellers try to do is they try to become retailer. And what do retailers try to do is they try to become wall seller. And both of these are trying to also buy some parts in some manufacturing in order to have some control. Now there's another type of wall seller, which um, is extremely important. It's the broker. So the broker is the, the agent in your, in your situation. It's the one that's going to have no ownership of all the ex expenses required to do the production. What it is, like, so, so the most famous one in America, real estate broker, um, finance broker, insurance broker. But in fact, you could be a broker in anything. You could be a, a broker of contact lenses. You could be a broker of wood. You could be a broker of diamonds. You could be a broker of oil, anything you can be a broker. And um, the job of being a broker is most likely to be the job in the world that makes the most money, more than surgeons, more than lawyers. It's the one in between. In fact, if you look at all those panels on the on side of the freeway that says, uh, call me if you have an accident, I'm a so-and-so lawyer or whatever, there's no, when you call, there's going to be no lawyers. 
what they are is they are brokers getting phone calls from people and they become leads. And then those leads are sold to the lawyers for the lawyers to call these people and see if they're interested to, to take over them. So this brokers for everything, this broker for uh, carpet. If you're a manufacturer of carpet, you get rich. If you're a broker of carpet, you can get even richer than the one that manufacture them because you're the one that has the least expenses. So but what do you need to become a very successful broker? What does it take to become rich? In other words, it takes to be hardworking, uh, trustworthy, consistent, and always there. And that's the job of a broker. And have everyone know you. So that's why you see real estate. How do you succeed in real estate? Everyone needs to know you and you need to know everyone. You need to go out all the time. You need to invite people all the time. You need to socialize all the time. You need to work seven days a week. You need to say yes and never say no. And you just keep on going with this smile and make sure everybody loves you and that you start getting one success, two success, 50 success. And then all you do is talk about your successes and then you become rich, wealthy, and successful being a broker. It's a fantastic job. I recommend it to everyone. When I ask my students who wants to be a broker, there's usually maybe one out of 200 people. They just don't realize it's one of the best jobs. So, so they understand because real estate is very um, popular. Now, the promotional mix, what is this? It's the last P that we would discuss. So the promotional mix is the fact, it, it should be called communication, but it, because you know we want four Ps to remember that, the four Ps, the marketing mix, so it's called promotional mix. What's inside the promotional mix? You have advertising, public creation, direct marketing, personal selling, sales promotion. So advertising is a non-personal, identified sponsor that is paying to be recognized. PR is um, publicity, pretty much uh, public relations. Direct marketing is sending an email, sending um, a phone call. I mean, we, I don't know if you got a lot of phone calls, but I got a lot of phone calls from different uh, politicians this past week. And so that's direct marketing. Whatever phone call you got, S, a uh, little text that you got, that's direct marketing. Personal selling is someone who's paid to speak about a product. And so it's face to face, um, uh, in the phone as well. And uh, that's uh, the beauty of personal selling, it is the most persuading. And so that's very important. Sales promotion is a special incentive at a short time. So what are the objectives of communication? One is to inform. You don't try to sell, you just try to get people educated, knowledgeable about the product. Persuade is you try to sell. So you create an incentive, make people see that they need it and that right now is the good time to buy because there's a cheaper price right now. And then um, comparing. So again, we're talking about the politician and that's very important. You know, the Democrats are gonna say we are better because those Republicans are crazy because of this and that and the vice versa the Republican would say the same thing. So they constantly compare with each other to show that one is better than the other. And then remind is the, it's sort of this reminding of the persuasion, information and comparison, because if you do it one time, you have to keep doing it. Otherwise people forget. Now, when you communicate, you have to look at the fact that you're communicating through a person directly. So it's one person communicating to another or it's non-personal and that's, the most efficient in the way. The most efficient is the personal, but the problem with the personal is you don't, cannot contact many people at once. So it's very, um, very limited amount of contacts, but the number of contacts, so let's say, how many people can you call a day? A hundred, how many sales you get? 15, so it, let's say 15%. So it's a very high return versus the non-personal, it's gonna be thousand for one. But the, the machine can take care of the non-personal, and that's the benefit. What are the uh, measure of success for a communication campaign? Well, first is, do they remember the message? Do they remember what they heard? Did, they, did it change their mind, the attitudes, positive attitudes, negative attitudes, all of that? And then the second, which I guess is much more important, is did it generate a sale? But it is difficult to see. Uh, when there is a sale, it's not that easy as to make a connection between um, communication and a sale. That's why coupons are very good because with coupons, you can measure people got the coupons, use the coupons. Therefore, there's a direct connection. How do you define your budget of communication? What I can afford? You know, that's essentially what we asked Lodi. What is your budget? What can you afford? Percentage of sales. So you want to increase your sales by 10 percent. 
increase your budget by 10%. What are the objectives? Objectives, I want to improve my reputation by 20%. So then you look at all the different actions that you should be doing in order to increase your reputation by 20%. And then the competitive parity is what are your competitors spent? So sales promotion is a mass communication method that generates an incentive. I just talked about this just a few minutes ago. Um, what is public relation? It's generating goodwill within your public by um, having favorable messages that reinforce this goodwill and maybe minimize the rumors. Um, and what is advertising is any paid form of non-personal presentation and uh, where you're promoting some ideas with a sponsor that is identified about paying. So what are the seven uh, major uh, communication advertising media? Is you have the TV, the radio, the magazine, the newspaper, the internet, the outdoor, such as the billboard and social media. One thing that you learn in, a, in another class uh, with Professor de Gravel is the Porter Five Forces. Using the Porter Five Forces is, is very good uh, because you can use it in the SWOT analysis. So when you do your PESOL, when you do your SWOT, um, looking at the threats, for example, you can talk about your competitors and the, the economy, the market, and some of the threats, maybe the fact that it's easy to enter the market, maybe there are many competitors, maybe there's no uh, barriers to entry to become a competitor, 